be um you know be putting a copy of this into the games in schools MOOC so people can go back and perhaps review the answers to the questions um you know or or they can share the content with with other people um a, a, as well um <clears throat> just a couple of things in in terms of the introduction so so first of all it's it's great to be able to speak to all of the participants live um we've been really really pleased with uh the feedback and the level of engagement of the games in schools at MOOC and I just wanted to maybe just take a couple of minutes to to reflect on some of the content that you've been exploring over the last few weeks we've looked at the module about why we think computer games can be engaging in the classroom we thought about using games for thematic learning and we talked about project-based learning and contextual hubs there we had a, a bit of a, a, a deep dive and some recommendations into different types of learning games games that are specifically made from learning um, this week, you've been thinking about what can we learn from games and you've been exploring some technology like augmented reality and virtual reality and um, and even things like geocaching, if you've got to the content this week. Um, and, and next week, which will be week five of the course, we're going to be looking um, a little bit at, at, at designing games. And uh, that's one of the reasons why we were really keen to to invite uh, Mitch Resnick um, to uh, to this online online webinar. We're really lucky to have uh, to have Mitch here, here joining us. Um, Mitch is the Lego Papert Professor of Learning Research um, and the Director of the Lifelong Kindergarten Group at the MIT Media Lab. Um, for those of you who don't know, MIT stands for the Massachusetts Institute of, of, of Technology. Um, and Mitch has done lots of things uh, in, in, in his life and I'll, I'll get him to introduce himself in, in, in a minute. Um, but one of the things that, that he, uh, he can absolutely take credit for is, is being a really, really important part of developing the Scratch visual programming language and also the online community that, that goes with that. So we're really, really pleased to have Mitch here with us. He's speaking to us from, from Boston, where it's just after 11 a.m. in the morning. Um, I'm joining you from the uh, from the Lego Foundation offices here in, in Billund. And I also saw from the different chat that we've got people here from, from Turkey, Portugal, Romania, Scotland, uh, Spain, Italy, and a, and a whole heap of, of other places as well. So it's uh, it really is going to be a bit of an international conversation tonight. And um, before I ask Mitch to introduce himself, which he'll, which he'll do in a minute, the kind of format will be is um, I've got some questions to ask Mitch, um, which are the sorts of questions that you would normally expect about his work and what he does. And then we've been through the online Padlet to, to pull together some of the themes of the questions that, that you've asked. Um, and then if we have time at the end, We'll also be able to, um, you know, to be able to take other questions in the chat forum as well. And we're, we're proposing this session. We'll we'll, we'll finish at, at um, we'll, we'll take about forty to forty five minutes. So, um, with no further ado, Mitch, thanks again for joining us. I know that you're you're in, you're incredibly incredibly busy, but I just wondered if you could just maybe spend a little time just telling uh, telling us a, a little bit about you um, and uh, a little, little bit about your, a little bit about your current work. Well, first of all. Uh, Thanks for inviting me to join the webinar, and it's great to connect with the European SchoolNet community. Um, and I've had great interactions with Ali and others at the LEGO Foundation for many years, so it's great to extend that collaboration you know, with this, through this webinar. As Ali mentioned, I'm a professor at the MIT Media Lab, where our work focuses on designing new technologies and activities to engage kids in creative learning experiences. And I emphasize the word creative because I think we really believe that there's nothing more important in the way in the world today than the ability to think and act creatively. And that's because the world's changing so quickly that we don't really know what exactly what you know, skills kids will need in the future uh, or what type of new challenges they'll confront as they, as they grow older. And because of that, it becomes so important for them to be able to think and act creatively, to come up with their own creative solutions to the unexpected situations that they'll undoubtedly confront. So we've been working on all different types of creative technologies and activities to help kids grow up as creative learners. We've had this long collaboration with the Lego company. If you want kids to be creative, building with Lego bricks is one of the ways of doing it, letting kids, giving kids tools to let your imagination run wild. And in some ways, we're trying to take the spirit of the traditional Lego brick and see how can we use new technologies to keep alive that same type of spirit, a spirit that allows kids to joyfully and playfully create things and collaborate. 
Hey, that, 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 that's great. And there were a, a, a couple of a couple of points there, um, may, maybe to pick up on. And one one of the things is that I know that you've uh, that you've called your group um, at at the MIT Media Lab the, the lifelong kindergarten uh, group. I, I wondered. Um, I wondered if you could maybe elaborate a little bit about why you chose that name, because I know that that name is, you know, is quite special to you and quite special to all the students that you've worked with with over time. But uh, maybe sharing a little about, bit about that would be would be great for the participants. Yeah. I've always been inspired by the way kids learn in kindergarten, and if you think about the traditional kindergarten, you can imagine a group of kids in one corner pulling out wooden blocks and building towers and castles and telling stories about the castles that they build. And on a table nearby, there are kids using crayons and finger paint to make different types of you know, you know, images and drawings. And in the process of creating those things, kids are learning a lot. When they make towers with wooden blocks, they learn about structure and stability. When they use finger paint, they learn how colors mix together. But maybe most important, they learn about the creative process. They learn how to start with an idea to you know, take the idea and create something based on that idea. You know, they have an idea about a fantasy city. They pull out the wooden block. They start building a castle. They start playing with it and experimenting. How can they build a bigger castle, a taller castle? They start collaborating with others. And some people start telling a story about the castle. Some people make a road in front of the castle. Uh, they start, you know, as they work together, they start reflecting upon you know, what worked well, what didn't work well. And then that sparks new ideas. They imagine new things and the spiral just keeps on going. And we see that happening in the best of kindergartens. Uh, but we think it shouldn't just be limited to kindergartens. We think that in kindergartens, kids get off to a great start at developing those creative capacities, learning about the creative process, thinking of how to turn ideas you know, into creative products. But then too often after kindergarten, they spend a lot of time filling out worksheets, listening to lectures, and they'll learn some things that way, but they don't really develop their creative capacities. So we really want kids to continue to develop as creative thinkers long after kindergarten, throughout their whole lives. One challenge is that sometimes certain things in society are headed in the wrong directions. You go into some kindergartens these days, and kids are filling out phonics worksheets and drilling on math flashcards. Uh, so kindergarten in many places is becoming more like the rest of school. And what we want to do in the Lifelong Kindergarten group is exactly the opposite, to turn the rest of school and the rest of life and to make it more like kindergarten. Um, so in all the tools and technologies we develop, we think about how can we take that kindergarten spirit of creative learning and bring it to learners of all ages. That's, that, that, that's just great. And I, and I know that um, as part of, of part of this course with a, with a lot of the, the European teachers that have been involved, we've talked a lot about active pedagogies and trying to encourage children to be more responsible to their own learning for their own learning you know through um through through, through technologies but also through other engaging experiences for example taking children outside and and doing things that are that, that are meaningful to, to them um i, I guess um the, the, and, and this links also nicely into some of the other things that we've talked about on the course the the other the other part of your title is obviously lego uh, puppet professor of, of learning research you mentioned that you um you mentioned that you've had a long-standing collaboration with the Lego Lego Group, so I think we we understand that part of it. But um, we, we've uh, we, we've talked a little bit about uh, about Seymour Papert and um, some of uh, some of some of Seymour's quotes. But but maybe for the for the people that aren't quite as familiar with uh, with Seymour's work, perhaps you would maybe just spend a little bit of a little bit of time, perhaps just telling people how how that's inspired you over over time. Well, I sometimes say I, I feel so fortunate to have the title Lego Papert Professor because maybe the two biggest influences and inspirations in my life were Lego and Papert. So I was fortunate enough to study with Seymour Papert as a graduate student and then work together with him as a colleague for many years. As some people know, Seymour passed away a few years ago. But Seymour had this deep influence. And Seymour is sometimes known as the creator of the first programming language for kids, Logo. But I think even more important, is the ideas that were underlying Logo and the other educational initiatives that Seymour undertook. I think Seymour you know, really was this deep believer in that the best learning experiences were come when kids were working on projects based on their passions. And that really influenced all the things he did. And he tried to think, how can he bring the new technologies into that spirit? And if you go back to when Seymour first started doing things with 
thinking about computers and education, you know, more than 50 years ago, like in the 1960s. I think in the beginning, when people thought about introducing computers for education, they thought about using computers to deliver instruction and deliver information. And then maybe kids would answer a question, computer if it, you know, would then you know, adopt its next piece of information based on whether it was right or wrong. So the computer was in charge and delivering information, delivering instruction, and adapting to the kids. And Seymour had a very different vision. He said, the most important learning happens not when you have instruction delivered, but when you get a chance to design, create, experiment, and explore. So they have active learning pedagogies that you know, evidently you've been you know, talking about in this course. I think Seymour really was a real leader in bringing that to active learning pedagogy. And even though it was long before anyone talked about the maker movement, Seymour, I think, was the intellectual godfather of the maker movement. He really believed that kids learn best when they're actively engaged in making things. He went beyond just learning by doing to learning through making. He had this real belief that there was this constant cycle back and forth that if kids made things in the world, enable them to make new ideas in their minds, which will let them to make new things in the world. So he had this idea of kids both making ideas and making things. So he really wanted kids to use, well, both traditional materials, but also new technologies for making things. He thought that was going to be the best pathway for, for, for learning. So I, I definitely, was, it was a big influence on me. And I've always tried to create things where kids are making things that they care about is sort of at the core of all of the work that we do. And that's deeply influenced by Seymour's ideas, which he called constructionism, about constructing things in the world that let you construct new knowledge. Great, no, no, absolutely brilliant. And, um, and we'll, we'll, as part of Games Course, we'll, we'll, we'll pick up a little bit on a few more of these ideas um, ne 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 next week. But um, one of the links that we'll, that we'll, put, in the, we'll put in the forum is, you know, you know, really, really the link to uh, to, to Seymour's, you know, groundbreaking book, as it was really the the the, the classic uh, Mindstorms uh, text. Um, of course, a lot of people these days associate Mindstorms with with Lego Mindstorms, but of, but of course, the Lego Mindstorms was actually named after a lot of Seymour's uh, early work. Work, and I always recommend to, to teachers that I work with is that the the first chapter of that book just has such a profound impact on me, you know, and, and how I thought about the use of technology with, with, with young people. It's, um, you know, it really is worth, uh, it really is worth reading. And, and I know um, Seymour's family kindly made a copy of that text available um, after he passed away a, a couple of years ago. It's available. Actually, I did just find out recently that next year is going to be the 40th anniversary of Mindstorms. It was published in 1980. And the publisher, Basic Books, is going to reissue it. So there'll also be a reissuing of the book for the 40th anniversary. Oh, that's amazing. That's great. That's great to hear. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so we wanted to to speak to you a, a little bit about a little bit about Scratch. Obviously, I mean, you're, you're you're famous for lots of things, and I know that Lifelong Kindergarten hasn't just developed Scratch. Uh, you've you've got a, a whole history of different innovative technologies, really. Um, you know, in in in, ed in education. Um, that's included uh, some of the, the small cricket computers that I remember so well from when I was a from when I was a classroom teacher. And we've already talked about the Mindstorm robotics and indeed some of the other robotic solutions that you've been involved in over time. But, um, but I think also participants of the course will you know they'll have heard of technologies such as the Makey Makey and uh, you know and and how and how those technologies again were, were incubated in your lab with some of your graduate students and how you, some of your thinking um, has it has informed has informed them. But I guess. At the moment, probably the thing that lifelong kindergarten is the most famous for is um, is Scratch. Um, so I, I just wondered if you could, and I'm I'm sure that most people have have heard about Scratch, although there probably will be a number of people that haven't used it yet. Um, people will get an opportunity to be a bit more hands on um, with with Scratch next week. But I wonder if you could maybe just spend uh, a, a few minutes explaining a little bit about Scratch and uh, and how and how that was developed and and what you've seen that be useful uh, over over time. Maybe I'll start with a bit of the origin story of how we got started on Scratch. You know, in the 1990s, my colleague Natalie Rusk and myself, we helped start some after-school learning centers called computer clubhouses, especially for kids in low-income communities. Um, and our goal was to have kids work on creative projects with new technologies. And in the 1990s, they would use things like Photoshop and take images and manipulate those images 
or early music composition tool to you know, develop their own you know, songs and music. But we saw that at the clubhouses, lots of kids wanted to create their own interactive stories and games, but there weren't the right tools for them to do it. Uh, Seymour Papert's logo programming language was available, but it hadn't really kept up with the times. It couldn't be used to, uh, to program the rich media that kids were interacting with and were familiar in their everyday lives. Kids wanted to take music and sound and images and be able to make them come alive, and that really wasn't possible. Of course, you could do it with traditional programming languages, you know, text-based traditional programming languages, but those were beyond and weren't really well suited for the kids coming to clubhouses. So we saw that there was a demand. Kids wanted to create their own interactive stories and games, and we knew that it would be a great learning experience for them. So there was both a demand, a need for, you know, from kids, but also we saw a great educational opportunity. And that's what's got us started work on Scratch. And we started using some of the new technologies that were available. So we started working on it like in 2002, 2003. And we want to take a more, to make it more accessible to kids, we, went, we moved away from text-based approach. We needed to learn all the obscure syntax. And we made a building block approach with graphical programming building blocks, somewhat inspired by Lego bricks. So you could build programs by snapping together blocks on the screen. We also had it lots of rich media so kids could make programs where they were manipulating sounds, music, images. And we integrated into the internet right from the beginning. Because this was at a time where sites like Flickr were just coming around, where people were starting to share photos online. So we thought, well, if kids are making pro programs and different animated projects and games, they should be able to share it as well. So from when we launched Scratch, we launched it together with an online community. At the time, no one had ever linked a programming language with an online community in quite that way. So when kids would create their own interactive stories and games with Scratch, they could immediately put it online and let other people start creating, start playing their game or interacting with their animation, and then give them feedback or you know, suggestions or encouragement. And we saw the online community served as both an audience where kids could you know, have others try out what they did, and also as an inspiration. Kids could just see what people have created um, and then get inspiration for what they might do. And now there's like about you know, 50 million projects that are shared in the Scratch community. Um, every month there's another million projects that get shared. Um, and but what's really exciting for us is not just the number of projects, but the diversity of projects. So I got most excited just by the wide range of different things kids have created, because we really designed Scratch to let kids let their imagination run wild. So you can make a wide range of things. So whatever kids can imagine, they should be able to create. Uh, so there's all different types of games, stories, animations you know, on there. And we see that as one of our indicators of success, the greater diversity of what kids create. It shows that they are building on their own interests. And we see so much of you know, there's, you know, kids are going to learn more and, you know, and stay engaged in the activity if they're working on things they really care about. That's, 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 re that's really, re really nice. And, uh, and, and again, and again, like you, I think that the, I think that the, the real strength of, of, of Scratch is, uh, is not just the tools that we're equipping young people with, but that, but that notion of community and, you know, an, on, an online support and audience that you say, which we, which we know is so important for, so important for young people to showcase their their work and to share and from um, and to learn and to learn from each other. Yeah, I think in designing and, and, Scratch, in designing Scratch, sorry, it was yeah. really guided by in, in in the lifelong kindergarten group. We sometimes talk about four guiding principles that guide all of our work. Uh, we call them the four P's of creative learning because in English they all start with the letter P: projects, passion peers, and play. Uh, and in designing Scratch and also all the other things we do, uh, we always were thinking about how can we let kids work on projects based on their passions in collaboration with peers in a playful spirit. So the online community is a way for them to interact with peers. Uh, the way we designed it to let kids follow their own, their own interests and imagination was a way to connect with their passions. Uh, the project-based approach, which I know you've talked about, you know, in this course was an inherent part of it. 
oftentimes when kids are introduced to programming, they're introduced just through a series of puzzles to solve and then move on to the next puzzle. We've seen that kids you know, are going to get a deeper understanding of the creative process when they get to work on projects, their own personal projects, and then doing it in a playful spirit, meaning they're constantly experimenting, you know, trying new things. So I think you know, we designed it that way, and I think the success of Scratch is because it was really designed based on those four guiding principles. And, and, I, and I just think they're, they're, they're great principles to, to have as well, and, and great and great principles for us to think about in terms of what makes an excellent lesson or an, an excellent learning environment in in, in general. Um, I, I know that um, I, I know that, uh, that that one of the things that one of the many things that Scratch is used for by young people is to obviously be able to create their own uh, their own games um, linked off obviously into um, the four P's of creative learning that that, that you mentioned there. Um, I, I wondered, have you have you um, come across? Or well, I, I know you've come across, but have, have you got any any stories of um, you know some of your your, your favourite games that, that young people have been able to create using using Scratch? And I, and I and I know that people within the online course are, are really interested, um, you know, in, in in games that that kind of are, are more cross curricular in in nature. One of one of one of one of the things that I think is a is a real shame in a lot of European classrooms is that games design tends to be the domain of the computer lab where actually you know we can be using creative tools like scratch in a really cross curricular way to to be developing literacy numeracy science skills geography skills you know all all, all types of, of different types of learning but i but i wonder if you've got any favorite projects that have that have, that have been developed around games and, and gameplay well here's one that comes to mind actually this was from the early days of scratch it was one of those projects that when we saw it we saw this is working uh, it was, actually, actually, it was a project that grew out of a social studies class in a middle school where they were studying the island of Rapa Nui off of South America. It's called, also called Easter Island. Mm -hmm. So as part of a geography or social studies class, they were studying this. And then the kids had to do a report based on you know, what they had learned. Uh, actually, in this case, it was a student who had learned about Scratch on his own, and then asked the teacher, can I use Scratch you know, for my final project? And she said, you know, she didn't know about Scratch, but she said, sure. Later on, she started using it in the class. The teacher started using it. But for this first project, he designed this game around what he had learned about Rapa Nui. It was inspired by SimCity. It was sort of like Sim Rapa Nui. And it was a way for him to show what he had learned about the history, the culture, the economy of Rapa Nui, uh, and to help other people learn those things. So when you then start the game on Rapa Nui, you have to find a way to make a living. And it turns out that fishing is the main, uh, the big part of the economy. So what you have to do is you have to cut down a branch from a tree, make a fishing rod, go fishing, um, and that's a way you can start to bring in fish to be part of the economy. But if you cut down too many trees, uh, then you get real things knocked against you because the cultural tradition is to be very respectful of the environment. So it's a way that he you know, showed what he had learned about some of the cultural traditions. So again, the whole game was based around the economy, history, culture that he had learned. It was both a way for him to show what he had learned then to help other people learn about Rapa Nui as well. And as I said, that teacher then started using Scratch to have other you know, kids for other units create different you know, games around the different things that they were studying. And we've seen it used by lots of teachers across the board. And we do get particularly excited when it does get used across the curriculum. Because for us, the main point of learning to code is not to learn about computer science. Although that could be an important job skill and some kids will benefit from that and be able to go on and get jobs. But for us, it's, we, we like the analogy of learning to write. That when you learn to write, some kids will grow up to become professional writers, professional journalists or novelists, but most won't. But it's important for everyone to learn to write because it's a way to express your ideas and writing is used across the curriculum in school. And we think coding could and should be the same way. It shouldn't just be about learning computer computational concepts, but it's a new way of expressing yourself you can then use to help express whatever it is that you're learning about. That's great, and that's a that's a really uh, 
that's a that's a really great example um, uh, uh, as well to to tell. And I've heard you um, I've I've heard you speak a lot about about Scratch, and um, I'm all, I'm always surprised to hear about the 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 well, stories that I haven't heard of before that that are, that are inspiring as you know as young people have you know have, have, have developed things. Um, well, one of the um, one of one of the questions on on the Padlet was um, was was around uh, I, I guess interactions with 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 younger children. And, and I know that your group, as well as developing Scratch, you've also developed um, Scratch, Scratch Junior, um, which is, you know, I guess, uh, designed with younger children in, in, in mind. I, I wondered if you could just tell us a little bit about the difference between Scratch Junior and, and, and Scratch and where you see the advantages and disadvantages of, of, of both. Right. So when we designed Scratch, we designed it for ages eight and up. And that's largely where it's used, the, the big chunk of kids using Scratch are between like eight and 16 is where you know, it's most used. There, it's also used with some older kids. It gets used in some introductory computer science courses at universities, uh, but it's ages eight and up. But once it was out there, we saw lots of people were interested in saying, you know, how younger kids might also be able to express themselves through programming and younger, you know, siblings would see their older kids, use, their older siblings using Scratch, older brothers, older sisters, and they want to do something similar. But Scratch is pretty, you know, on the blocks, they're described in text. So it does require some, you know, skills of reading. And also, although we've, you know, we've made Scratch, we think really accessible, easy to use language, it has a wide range of features to it. So we thought for younger kids, we would be useful to develop a version of Scratch that was a little bit, you know, narrower, that had fewer blocks. Uh, each of the blocks maybe would have some new special you know, capabilities. It would have more graphic icons as opposed to words of the blocks to explain what to do. Um, and it would be focused more on that type of storytelling world. So we made these storytelling worlds where kids can put sequences of actions together for the different characters and you know, be able to write like a script for a play in making the story world. So we worked on this together with a colleague of mine, Marina Bears and her research group at Tufts University. Uh, and she's done a lot with early childhood learning. So it was a perfect partner for this. So with Scratch Junior, we really aim for age five to seven. And it's gotten out in the world and it's used by lots of kids. It's, it was designed specifically for tablets, so it runs on various tablets. Um, and I think it's a great way for kids to get started. With Scratch Junior, we did not have an online community. We thought it wasn't appropriate for five to seven year olds. So it's more meant for kids either doing it with their parents or in a classroom where they're sh you're sharing it in person with other kids or with teachers, you know, in that setting. Yeah, great, great. No, re re really good. And, um, and just for the, I guess, for the, the people that, are, that, have, that have dialed in from, from, from across Europe is that we'll, we'll talk about next week when we, when we look at the, uh, the designing game module, we'll talk about Scratch Junior and we'll also, we'll talk about Scratch and, um, and introduce you to some resources that you can find, um, both on the Lifelong Kindergarten website and the MIT website and the Scratch Foundation website and, and other websites that, that are really promoting some of these some of these resources. Let me, one thing I often forget to mention, that's so all I'll say it now, that <laughs> all the things I've talked about are free, that Scratch, the Scratch Online Community and Scratch Junior are all free, because I think we have a real commitment to making sure that, that, that the tools are accessible to all kids, uh, so we don't want any friction for kids not to be able to get access to it. So we really focus on Scratch and Scratch Junior, you, you're all accessible for free. Yep, absolutely. And, and, and I think the other thing, um, again, just to, just to let people know if people aren't aware is that the, uh, obviously there's, a, there's an offline version of Scratch as well that can be downloaded, um, that can be downloaded locally. And, and we know that there are lots and lots of schools, you know, from around the world that, 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 make, that make use of this. Um, because we do struggle, you know, even even in Europe, well, in many places in Europe, um, with connectivity. Some, uh, you know, some sometimes in schools. So being able to download that local version as well, um, it can be can be incredibly incredibly handy. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested, um, Mitch, and it, and it linked into one of the other questions. You you, you mentioned that um, that you see obviously use of Scratch between children eight to sixteen, and sometimes it's used to introduce computer science to to older students at, at, at university. Do, do you see um, do you see much intergenerational work of, with Scratch, where old, older older children are working with younger children to introduce them with with with, with concepts? Is that something that that you see a lot of? Yeah, I, I do think it's used a lot that way. 
I, I always makes it. Ha I always get, I'm happy when at schools we'll often see things where uh, they'll arrange it for students from an older grade to help students with a younger grade, and also a lot of kids who become really excited about Scratch will then volunteer. We have a number of kids in the community who then tell us that you know once they're you know in high school they go back and volunteer at their elementary school because they want to help introduce Scratch you know to younger kids. Uh, so we do see a lot of that. And then sometimes we've seen some examples of also even more intergenerational of like seniors who will then get involved in something that they can do together with their grandchildren and they become interested in it. So we see various ways that it cuts across. One of my former uh, graduate students, Rick Rose Roque, did an entire initiative called Family Creative Learning where she used Scratch and other technologies like Makey Makey and brought families together where parents and kids worked on projects together. And it was great because I think they both learned from one another because both the parents and the kids each brought their own strengths. Sometimes the kids were more you know, fluent with some of the details of the technology, but the parents often had you know, better background of how to avoid getting frustrated when things go wrong and how to be persistent as you keep on working on a problem. Um, and I think one thing that I think was nice through Rick Rose's research is she saw how both the parents and the kids learned from one another and gained a new respect for one another. That, that, that's great. And I mean, I've been uh, really quite inspired by Rick Rose's work as well. I, I, I love the I love the very, very simple conceptual model around the idea of uh, meet, eat, make and share. So you, you, you bring people together, you sit around the table and you and you have a meal, you know, as a you know, as a group. You, you, you make something sometimes individually, but increasingly as the course progresses with children and adults working together, then you, then you, then you share your findings. I think there's, um, there's a huge amount of learning just in those, uh, in, in those, in those four words. It's really, really, really great. Yeah. So, um, it, it, it's been, uh, um, I guess we're coming towards the end of, of, of 2019, the year's gone, the year's gone incredibly quickly. Um, but, but I know that the year started incredibly busy for you and the rest of the scratch team, because. I think it was the second of second of January where Scratch 3.0 was uh, was was launched, which was a which was a huge project um, to be able to do that from a from a technical point of view and an infrastructure point of view. But but also Scratch 3.0 brings some really interesting new features that that we haven't had before um, on you know on Scratch. Things like uh, video sensing and the ability to um, you know be able to use more sophisticated voice commands, I guess and uh, a better audio editor and um, the ability to to connect in an easier way things like the micro bit and uh, and other Lego robotics solutions, um, and and I and I guess I was just wondering, have you, in terms of again young people uh, using using Scratch to create uh, games, play, playful games, have you have you seen any any good examples of of how some of these new features have been have been able to be integrated into 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 gameplay in a in a creative way? Yeah. Yeah, so first of all, we've been really excited. You know, three, Scratch 3.0 was a total rewrite of Scratch to create a, a, a stronger infrastructure for the future. As you mentioned, one of the things we're especially excited about are what we call extensions, where you can keep on adding new sets of blocks for new capabilities. So it makes it more modular that we can keep on adding new capabilities over time. Um, one way, as you mentioned, is to connect to the physical world. Um, so you mentioned that you can connect, now easily connect the micro bit to Scratch. I've seen some great games where kids use the, mic, the sensors of the micro bit to make their own physical controller for things on the screen. So like make a car racing game and then make a physical steering wheel with the micro bit and then using the, the input from the, you know, the sensors of the micro bit, the accelerometer, can tell how you're tilting uh, the steering wheel and then use that to control the car on the screen. Um, so I think we run whole workshops where kids are just making a wide variety of different types of games using the micro bit and scratch. I think what we like about that is that we think that kids learn a lot when they're making things. And this gives them an opportunity for two types of making. They're both making a project on the screen with scratch and then making a physical controller in the world. Um, and I think when you have multiple experiences with making and designing things, it gives you a deeper understanding about the process of making and designing. Uh, it also connects to the interests of different kids. Some kids will want to put a lot of energy into the physical 
you know, controller they're making and make a simple game. Others will make this really elaborate game and a simple physical controller. So different kids can use it in different ways, build on their interests, but also try new things. Yeah, that, that, that's great, and I and I love that uh, I love that idea again about um, being able to uh, to make digitally, but also to make physically, and to be able to combine both of those and and young people working in collaborative teams that to you know to really to pull on their individual um, their individual strengths, you know, working together again, uh, working together again on 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 these on these different different projects. Um, which which kind of leads me in, interestingly on to the next question. And I know that you've you've got an, an, an opinion on this. Is that sometimes in, in Europe, and I'm sure you know in the in the US as well. Um, you know, you know, quite often uh, kids and, and children, you know, in front of screens is seen as being a bad thing. <laughs> um, I, I I come from a camp that probably too much of anything is a, is a bad is a bad thing. You know, over, over time. But um, but have you? Have you, have you got a have you got an opinion or I know you've got an opinion but um would, would you mind sort of sharing your opinion on the whole you know screen time creativity time debate yeah see I tend not to focus so much on whether kids are using a screen or not as you said I think kids should have a variety of experiences if kids spend all of their time looking at a screen that's not good but if they spend all of their time reading a book that's not good or if they spend all of their time playing the violin that's not good you know, things that are good to do. It's great to read a book. It's great to play the violin. If you spend all of your time doing any of those things, it's not good. We want kids to have a diversity of experiences. But I wouldn't think about screens any differently than I think about other media or other materials. Um, it's one of the many, you know, things that you can be interacting with. So rather than making a strong distinction about what materials or what medium you're using, I do focus more on how you're making use of them. So. I you know, sometimes say I'd rather, I'd rather focus on maximizing creativity time rather than minimizing screen time, or yeah, rather than minimizing screen time. And you know, of course, if kids are using screens in a non-creative way, I'm not going to be very happy, uh, and I'd much rather them doing something else. On the other hand, if they're using screens to be designing, creating, experimenting, I can see that as a good use. It's also great if they're building towers with Lego bricks or building a tree house outside, or, you know, there are all types of, or using craft materials to make an artistic sculpture. So there are a lot of different ways that kids can be making things on screen and off screen, but I'd focus more on giving them opportunities to create. And I wouldn't focus so much on whether it's on screen or off screen, but just make sure they have the opportunity to make and create. Yeah, great, great. And, and uh, you, you've obviously heard me try to play the violin, so that's uh, where you made that first comment, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, it's I've got I guess one more one one more question I wanted to ask you as well because um you know when when we talk about games in games in schools um I I, I come very much from the from from the camp of uh, there are some games that are that have been designed for learning that are very very good there are a lot of games that have been designed for learning that aren't that good but children just tolerate them um, and we've we've talked about that you know in in the course I also come from the camp that I I really like. The use of games for for rich thematic learning opportunities, and again, young people, and then teachers and young people can scaffold areas of the curriculum off that um, as, as themes, and and the whole um, and the, and the whole uh, idea of young people being able to create their own content using technologies uh, like like Scratch to be able to be able to be able to do that. Um, but one of the uh, you know when you one one of the things that I noticed in, increasingly. Um, you know, since I've been involved in this course, which is which has been over, over eight years now, is that the word gamification, you know, has really uh, has really taken off. In fact, if you if you uh, if you put the term gamification into a into a Google into a Google search um, and you look at that in Google Trends, uh, it, it it is so much higher than any other terms like for games for learning or you know learning through games in the classroom or le or, or or learning or learning through play. Um, but I, but I think I have some, I have some concerns about gamification and and, the, and applying game metrics to, to um, to, to what might actually be traditional classroom classroom learning. Um, I just wondered if if you had a perspective on 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 that as well, the, the whole gamification debate and what might be appropriate and what what might not. Yeah, and yeah, I also have some uh, concerns about the idea of gamification. And of course, different people mean different things by that. Yep. I think one way that some people talk about gamification is 
where you're adding some incentive structures where people are getting some types of points or rewards based on what they're doing. And of course, this can be applied not on the computer, but to anything in life. You can add points and rewards uh, to try to, you know, I think it's often done to motivate kids. And that's often called gamification, drawing on the way that points and rewards are often used in games. And you can understand the reasons why that has an attraction in education. Education, educators see that kids get really drawn into games and really immersed in games. Uh, so they say, well, why don't we take some of those same structures from games and some of the incentive structures, and that can help kids get engaged in all sorts of different things. So I can understand the motivation, but I do have concerns because I feel that if you motivate just through uh, points or rewards or what are sometimes called you know, extrinsic rewards, things on the outside, it actually can be effective of getting sort of a short-term burst of motivation. If you want to have someone get interested for a short period of time, give them some points, rewards, and it might motivate them. Sometimes it's been, you know, the analogy of getting a jolt of energy from drinking coffee. On the other hand, if you want to have sort of a sustained engagement in a set of ideas, and I think as educators, we want kids to be, have a sustained engagement in the things that they're learning about. And I think the research shows that extrinsic motivators and extrinsic rewards often aren't very good for that, and sometimes can even be counterproductive because kids will come rely upon it. They'll only be interested in doing things if they're offered points of rewards. So we've tried to put more emphasis in our work on building on kids' interests. If we connect to kids' interests, that's where their motivation will come from and will last longer over time. If they can develop a deep personal interest or passion, one of those four Ps, passion. So if they develop an interest or passion, that will serve as a motivator that keeps them going for a longer period of time uh, and let them go deeper with things. So I sometimes worry that gamification is used as like a quick fix, but sometimes can run counter to what really I think should be the a deeper goal of education of helping kids find the things they're really interested in and then be able to use their own personal interests in, in driving forward. Great. No, that's that's great. And uh, and I think that's a I think that's a, that's a very good answer, and that's a and that's something for us to be to be to be thinking about um, for the participants on the on the course as we as we as we look at what we can learn from learn from games um, th th this week. Um, and maybe just have one other quick question to ask you, if if that, if that's okay, because um, during the during the last week of the the course, um, we're going to be talking a little bit about um, why it's important to teach about games, um, and that will include people learning a little bit about um, family control settings for games consoles, but also we have age rate, age appropriate games, you know, in, in Europe and a system called PEGI, which comes in, in, into place. But, but the reason I, I would be interested to get your, your opinion on it is that I know when the Scratch online community, you know, was, you know, was, 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 was developed, um, there, there probably are some people that, that maybe perceive that with a little bit of risk. You know, as in you had young people in these communities and they were developing games and they were able to talk to each other and do all these things. But I, but I guess that um, that you probably, you know, come, come from the camp that it's that it's about it's about responsible use and it's about responsible behavior, both um, online, online and, off, and, and, and offline. And I've heard you I've heard you speak before a, a little bit about some of the other key messages that that Scratch helps young people develop, for example, the, the concept of sharing. And openly sharing contents and build, building on other, other people's creations. So I wondered if you could maybe just, and this will be the, the last question, just just spend a couple of minutes, maybe, maybe sharing a few things that that you've that you've learned from the community um, that, that that have actually become rich learning experiences. Yeah, I mean, I think sometimes you know we think that part of what we want kids to be gaining from their interaction with Scratch and the online community is to become good digital citizens, to be responsible citizens of the communities that they're part of. Um, and obviously a lot of online communities have a lot of, you know, sort of harsh sides to them. Uh, so we've had to work very hard to try to keep Scratch as a safe and friendly community. There's some online communities for kids who achieve that by really restricting expressiveness. That all the kids can do is they can choose from a, a list of, you know, pre-written responses. And that way you can keep it safe because all that you can do is choose from a, a list of responses. 
We want kids to be expressive. So we're always trying to find the balance of how to let them be expressive, but also to make sure that the community stays as a safe and friendly place. So we've done a lot of things. We try to model it from the beginning of, uh, we had you know, people on our team from the beginning you know, show what constructive comments are like. You know, we have a set of moderators who are you know, responding to challenges in the community when people make comments to one another that are mean-spirited uh, towards one another. People in the community play a big role in this. They report things when things go wrong. And we take a look at that. Um, also, kids have to learn how to share. We run Scratch as a type of open source community. When you put a Scratch project in the community, other people you know, can look inside, can see how you made the project, and they can even take parts of your project and use it inside their project. Or they can, take, they can make small modifications to your project and then repost it. So so-called remixing. And a lot of times when kids see that, at first they'll be upset. They'll say, so-and-so stole my code or they stole my ideas. And we say, no, in Scratch, you can build on each other's code. Of course, you should give recognition. That's part of being a good community member. A good citizen is you give recognition and credit to people that you're building upon. The same way in the scientific community that you publish a paper, you make references to what you're building upon. In Scratch, you should make reference, and some of this is done automatically by the Scratch system, but then kids should also give personal acknowledgements. Again, this is an important lesson to learn, but not an easy lesson to learn. You know, we sometimes say, if you think learning to code is hard, try learning to share. So they can learn to share is even you know, harder than learning to code, uh, but it's an important thing for kids to learn. So I think uh, our real hope is that as kids participate in online community, they'll come out with, uh, having a new way of being empathetic towards others, caring towards others, being able to share and cooperate and collaborate with others, not just in the Scratch community, but throughout their lives. That's great. And that's a, that's a, that's a great way to kind of, uh, I guess, kind of end the, end the session as well with that, with that very powerful message. Um, so I think, Mitch, what we, what we would like to say from, from all of us over here, over here in Europe, although I, I did notice we've got some uh, people that have joined us from elsewhere in the world as well, which is, which is absolutely absolutely great. Is is I think we'd just like to say a massive thank you for you know for giving your time today. We know that you're you're in, you're incredibly busy um, both with your work as a professor at the Media Lab, but also um, you know as the acting executive director at the you know at the at the, at the Scratch Foundation. Um, I just want to assure all of the participants that we'll uh, we'll post a recording of this video um, online. We we know that well we know that we've had seventy plus people in the room at various times, which has just just been great, and we know from previous webinars that we've done then it, that this will be watched you know hundreds of more times with all of the people that we've got participating in 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 this course so so thank you so much um you know for for your for your time there and also i guess just to um just to remind the participants that we're going to be talking a little bit more about creating games next week so we'll be talking more about scratch we'll be talking more about scratch junior um, and we'll be physically signposting you a little bit more um towards some of the resources on the lifelong kindergarten page um and another and other resources that you can that you can get and you can access for free for people that are interested in this. So, so just to, just again, Mitch, a, a massive thank you from from all of us here in Europe. Um, you've 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 been uh, you, you've you've answered the questions as well as I knew that you would, but um, but you've you've also shared some great stories and some inspirational ideas um, for us to all take away back to our classrooms as well. Okay, well, it's been great talking with you and great to be interacting with the European Schoolnet community. Uh, so, I uh, hope you'll. Enjoy the rest of the course, and as we like to say on Scratch, scratch on. <laughs> Thanks, Mitch. You have a have a have a good have a good afternoon and and the rest of the, your day. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye.